Don't get too excited. Good to see you this morning. We were over at our Magnolia campus this morning. Had a great service there. and believing God for the same thing here. Looks like you already got things going. Worshiping and praising the Lord. It is good to see you today. Summer's about over. Somebody needs to tell the weatherman. Aren't you loving this fall weather? <laughs> but it is good to see you today. Just uh, looking forward to what the Lord has for us as we get into the fall. And uh, there's a lot of things going on. Remind you about the leadership dinner for those who are involved in any ministry. Whether in your leadership of that ministry or volunteer in that ministry, you need to make sure that your ministry team leader knows that you're going to be there at the leadership dinner. All right, the information's in the bulletin, but it's just real important that you be there and be a part of what the Lord's got going in this next season for us. We want to be all on board and be a part of that. So don't miss that. Mark it down your calendars. We are in the ninth and the final message on breaking free. And uh, as we've gone through this, each sermon is kind of built on the other. Maybe this is the first time you've been here, just getting on the sermons. But this is going to be a little bit different from every sermon we've been preaching in the series. Not just a little bit different, it's going to be a lot different. So I, I hope you're ready for something different this morning. Well, what we're going to do is, uh, you and me, you're just going to forget everybody else is here. It's just you and me. You singularly. We there now? Everybody else is gone, it's just you and me. And I'm going to go through some, basically an inventory of our spiritual walk and our spiritual life, where we are, where you are, and we're going to respond to that, you and me, and I'm going to take you through about seven steps briefly this morning in about 35, 40 minutes, which normally takes me, if, we, if it was you and me just in a counseling session, probably take us almost a couple hours to get through this. But we're going to give you the abbreviated form. This is what I, I, I go through with folks who are coming in and say, I'm really struggling in some area of my life, and there's a particular area of, a, of addiction, perhaps, or a bondage, or some stronghold in their spiritual walk in life, and they just been, haven't been able to get free. And so these are some of the things we want to walk through. This is, just, this is brief, all right? But we want to make it as personal as possible. So for us to do that, you're just going to have to kind of just use your sanctified imagination for a moment and just lock everybody else, and let's just get into this lesson and get into the Word of God together. So, and it really doesn't matter if you hadn't heard all these sermons all together. We'll kind of briefly review some things as we go through this. But I really want you to take a, an honest, open inventory of your own heart and your life. Be, just put yourself in a place right now where you let the Lord just deal with you and whatever he wants to say to you. You know, it's like David said, Lord, search me. See if there be any harmful way in me. Just embrace that attitude this morning of kind of letting the Lord just shine the light on and deal with anything that may have been causing you an issue in your spiritual walk in life. Remember, God's goal for our life in Scripture is that we walk in freedom. And we've said each one of these lessons, the basis for freedom is always the Word of God. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So we're dealing with issues of truth. We may even talk about some things that aren't truth, counterfeits, those kind of things, deception. The criteria for assessing if something is false or counterfeit in my life is always the truth. It's the Word of God. So we're going to look at the Word of God today as well as our own individual hearts and just kind of walk through these little inventory, these little steps that I'm going to share with you this morning and then take them with you because it's something that you can take and spend some time in your own personal quiet time, your own personal prayer closet. And I really honestly know that if you get real serious about this, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll walk away in freedom this morning, especially if there's some area that's really been tying you up. You'll walk away in, in freedom. So I believe no matter where you are, young or old, in, in, this, in this group, that this message is for each and every one of us. Uh, and I also want you to know that Satan is a liar, and he's defeated, and he has no authority over Christians. You know, we don't have to be bound by things, and we've talked about levels of bondages in Christian's life from everything from just being the gossip in the church to all the way to being the, the, the drug addict, you know, from one extreme to the other. We don't, have to be, we don't have to fall into captivity into these kind of things in our life. We can be free. We don't have to be bound by these sins, habits, voices, or condemnation, or whatever it might be. I have a quote here from one of the early church fathers, Tertullian, and he, he wrote this. He says, mock as you like, but get the demons, if you can, to join you in the mocking. Let them deny that Christ is coming to judge every human soul. Let them deny that for their wickedness, condemned already, they are kept for that very judgment day with all their worshipers and all their works. 
why all the authority and the power we have over them is from our naming the name of Christ and recalling to their memory the woes with which God threatens them. Fearing Christ and God and God and Christ, they become subject to the servants of God and Christ. So at our touch, our breathing, they're overwhelmed by the thought and the realization of those judgment fires. They leave at our command the bodies they have entered unwilling and distressed. Basically what he's saying is, you shouldn't be afraid of the enemy. The enemy is afraid of you. You don't have to be taunted by the devil. The devil is afraid of you. Any believer who wakes up one day and begins to discover who they really are in Christ, you realize they don't have to take it from Satan anymore. If you're on our e-blast, I sent out a, an e-blast on Wednesday that we send it out every Wednesday. If you'd like to get it, be sure and put your uh, email address in one of the offering receptacles when you leave today. Origen, one of the early church fathers also said this. He said, the Christian, the true Christian, I mean the one who's submitted to God alone in his word, will suffer nothing from demons. He's mightier than demons. We despise them and demons when despised can do no harm to those who are under the protection of God who can alone help all those who deserve his aid. In other words, if you're under the banner of Christ, if you're living submitted to Christ, there's no fear for you in your life of Satan or demons or anything he can throw at you. Because of what Jesus Christ has done by offering his life as a sacrifice for our sins, overcoming death, hell, Satan, and the grave. We are the ones who have victory. But our point of victory is not my intellect, it's not my, my, my wisdom. My point of victory is just embracing Jesus Christ. And it's my responsibility to do that. It's my responsibility to daily as a Christian stand upon the Word of God, believe God, and trust God. My, I am saved. I am made righteous. I am made new. But I do have a responsibility if I'm going to enjoy the freedoms that are mine in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are not free as a Christian, it's usually because one of two things. One, because you, uh, you have failed to stand upon the Word of God. It may be that you don't know the Word of God, or maybe you have ignored the Word of God. But when you fail to do what you know is right, and you fail to trust and believe when God's called you to do that, then you open the door for, for the enemy to bring any kind of onslaught he desires. The other reason we don't walk in victory is because we just absolutely disobey. We know it and don't do it. We just do what we want to do. We talked about that last week in the context of self-deception. It's easy to deceive ourselves and say that we don't have sin when we do have sin. And we do that by justifying what we're, what we're doing. We say, well, it's all right for me to do this, even though I know these principles in the Word of God which talk about this uh, and, and, and deal with these kind of issues about my life. I do it anyway because, and you have your special circumstance, but there's no special circumstances in the Word of God. The Bible says we're all tempted in the same manner. We all have the same Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, if we know Him as our Lord and Savior. And we can all have victory over temptation if we're willing to trust God. In other words, we're not some victim caught in a helpless tug of war between light and darkness, you know, or, or the angels and the devils and being pulled back and forth. And if we have those kind of false concepts, it really warps our mind and keeps us from walking in spiritual truth. So we want to know the truth, believe the truth, and trust the truth. So it's my responsibility, it's your responsibility to deal with issues. Now, when I, if it's just you and me in the, in the room this morning, first thing I will deal with you about today is this. One is you have to confront any false concepts before you go anywhere with this. You say, what do you mean? A lot of people have some distorted concepts of God. They don't have a true picture of, of, of God, their father, a true picture of the relationship with the Lord Jesus. Some people feel like, you know, they have to perform for God. If they get their works all done just right, then God will be happy. If not, God's mad at them. They don't understand that we're accepted in the beloved. Yes, God desires for us to walk, requires for us to walk in the liberty that he's called us to. We don't have to be enslaved to ourself or to sin. But hey, God doesn't, God doesn't have this merit badge honor system based upon my good works and my bad works, all right? It's, it's the grace of God. Some people have a, have a distorted view of God based upon perhaps their past relationship with their own father. And because, you know, that things weren't good there, then they look at God and they say, well, if God's father, then, you know, how, how good is that kind of deal? That's a distorted concept. You want to see what kind of father God is? Read his book. He makes it very clear of what kind of father that he is. Some people, as I said just a moment ago, alluded to, they don't believe that the same principles in the Word of God apply to them as it does to other Christians. Like, I'm a special case, you know. So because I'm a special case, I don't have to, I, I can ignore certain scriptures, you know. 
And if I ignore certain scriptures because it doesn't apply to me because my situation, uh, that's, that's a distorted concept. When I deal with people in a counseling room situation and we're dealing with issues of bondage or strongholds or areas in their life they can't seem to get victory over, uh, I really always want to encourage them that we're not here to, 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 to uh, deal with demons. We're here to deal with them and for them to deal with the demons and for them to deal with the issues. People say, uh, do you deal with deliverance services? I don't get into a power conflict with Satan. Amen. Jesus just said, be gone. That's right. <laughs> You're done here. It's over. And that's, that's the same kind of authority that we have in Christ Jesus. I have discovered that when people get in counseling situations, and those who've ever done this before, or maybe you've been in the situation where you can relate to this, that when you get in that kind of situation, when you're really in, things are in your life and are right, you, man, you start getting headaches and, or fears or dizziness, and, and some people are almost going catatonic when you start dealing with them about the issues of their heart and life. But remember this morning, all that we're doing is, if you'll be honest, we're just kind of go through an inventory uh, of things. And here's what we're going to do take you about seven steps real quickly this morning and hopefully you'll carry them with you and you'll look over these things. I believe but one or two of them that God's really going to bring to your heart whatever that might be. That's between you and the Lord. And you can deal with them it, it, it further as you go out of this place. But be willing to hear what the Lord has to say. Don't say well that's not me. I don't want to talk about it. Think about what God says. To, and first of all I want us to pray. And what we're going to do is we go through each one of these steps. We're going to stop. As I said, this is not your normal Sunday morning sermon of it, you know, exegeting certain scriptures or going through a little expository lesson. These are some steps that I would take you as an individual through in a counseling situation. And so again, we're just going to pretend it's you and me. Amen. Amen. All right. At least those four of you that are going to be with me on this. <laughs> it's just you and me. And we're going to just kind of pay attention on that level. And then if I ask you a question, you can answer it in your heart and mind, all right? Just acknowledge whatever the Lord's saying to you, and God will deal with that. But what we're going to do is we're going to stop after each one of these steps, and we're going to have a, just a word of prayer that, just associated with that, all right? And make, you know, claim our victory in a certain area, or stand on a certain promise of God's Word. And the interesting part about this is, even though it's, there's a multitude of people in the room, there's just you and me in reality, that's the way God deals with you. He deals with you as that individual in this room today. And if you'll let him speak to your heart, he'll do so. And you know, I don't know about you, I want God to speak to me today. And I hope you want God to speak to you today. So it is a different kind of sermon. Bear with me, all right? Because we're just talking because, hey, it's just you and me anyway, right? So let's you and me bow our heads. And I want you to kind of whisper this prayer out to the Lord with me, just after me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. And I thank you for his shed blood. I acknowledge your presence in this room and in my life. And right here and right now, I declare my dependence on you. Because apart from you, I can't do anything. I acknowledge my position in Jesus, seated with him in heavenly places. And because you, Jesus, have all authority, I claim the authority you've given me over the enemy of my soul. And I reject him and any of his little spirits that will try to be around me at this time. I agree right now that Satan's defeated, has no authority in my heart. And that he cannot inflict any pain or confusion or prevent me from hearing what you want to say to me. I thank you for that, Jesus, in your precious name. Now, I'm going to ask you to be real honest as we go through this. Again, it's between you and me here, and it's you're, you and the Lord as we talk about this. And, and to deal with these things, is, is, like I said, it's a little different sermon than what we'd normally deal with. But if the opposing thoughts come, just be honest. Say, where, where's that coming from? And realize that you are in spiritual arena. You are fighting spiritual battles in your life. And whether it's here or in your car or at home or on your job, conflicts always come in the spiritual arena. We just need to learn how to deal with them. So we're going to go through these steps of freedom. And again, they're nothing more than kind of a moral inventory, kind of a rock solid uh, statements of commitments to truth of God's word. All that we've been teaching on spiritual freedom is kind of wrapped up in, in the application of what we're doing today. So let's look at this. Step one is, is pretty simple. Did I just skip it? Yes, I did. Are you running that for me or am I running it? <laughs> Are you sure? It's not going back. Anyway. Step number one deals with counterfeit versus the real. 
You know, there's all kinds of things in the world. One of the things that I do with people in, in counseling is I give them, before they come in, a checklist of things. Were you ever involved in these things? And it lists on it everything from all the occultic practices, the cultic practices, as well as Satanism and witchcraft, Ouija boards, mystical things, everything. There's a list of about 100 different things on this checklist that I take people through and ask them to, to check those off. And I found out a lot of people have been involved with some things like Mormonism or Jehovah Witness and some of these other things that are, are like near truth, but they're not the truth. All right. Uh, you know, the Church of Science of Mind, Scientology, all these things that, that talk about Jesus and talk about God. But they don't they don't match the criteria of the word of God. Amen. All right. There's some invention of men that came up and took out from the word of God and tried to build some kind of philosophy around that. And it's just not the word of God. And so we always want to come to the place where we deal with any counterfeits that are in my life. The early church used that statement in their services as well as their doctrinal statements that when they would stand together, they'd say, I renounce you, Satan, in all your works and all your ways. So we embrace a different work and way. That's the way of Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Anybody that tells you there is an additional avenue or another way to God other than Jesus, who's the way, the truth, and the life, that's counterfeit. You reject it. I don't have time for it. I ain't got time to study it. I don't have to look at it. I, you know, it's what, I, what I want to commit myself to is truth. And so as we deal with this first step, always in dealing with people or dealing with you, dealing with me, is, is to deal with the things that might be counterfeit in my life. The most important thing in my life is the Lord Jesus Christ. When Paul wrote the church in, in Corinth, he said, listen, I, I fear lest by any means a serpent, the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety that your mind should be corrupted I love this, from the simplicity that's in Christ. For if he comes and preaches another Jesus whom you've not preached, or you receive another spirit which we've not received, or another gospel which you've not accepted, I'm afraid you might bear with it, is what he's saying. In other words, there's another message out there that's not Jesus. It may have Jesus in it, but it's not the gospel message. There's a lot of Jesuses out there. The Bible says there'll be a lot of antichrist. There's a lot of people who come to you and present a Jesus, which isn't Jesus of the scripture. It isn't the real Jesus. The, the Mormon Jesus is not the real Jesus, all right? The, 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 uh, the Jehovah Witness is not presenting the real Jesus. There are different gospels. There are different messages. There, there are other ways other than the way, the only way to God. So we renounce those things. Jesus said, he that is not with me is against me. In other words, if it's not centered around Jesus, then it's not the truth. In fact, he says, at that point, then if you're not gathering, you're scattering. So there's a lot of religions and, and a lot of cults that talk about Jesus. Jesus said unto them in John 8, he said, uh, you shall die in your sins if you do not believe that I am he. You will die in your sins. I mean, he reiterated. In other words, this is the only way to salvation. That's from the same chapters where he's talking about, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. So one thing I want you to take a review of this morning, we're going to ask God to speak to your heart this morning about is, have you ever been... Have ever participated in anything like that? You went that way, you believed that way, you followed that way, you read that material, whatever it might be, might be some science of mind kind of thing, some new age thing, then there is an important step that I always encourage people to take, and that's a step of renouncing the counterfeit and saying, I embrace the truth. I only want what God has for my life. So I want us all just to bow our heads, use an individual with me. I want you to pray this prayer. Just whisper it out with your own little ears here. Just say, Dear Heavenly Father, I ask you to show me if there's any occultic practice or false religion or false teacher that I have knowingly or even unknowingly been involved with. Now you just wait for a moment. If there has, the Lord just brings something to your mind. You say, then confess it. Lord, I have participated in, and I ask you to forgive me. Would you do that? I have participated in and I ask you to forgive me. And I renounce that, Father, as counterfeit to true Christianity. I only want the truth in Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, that's similar to the statement the early church made when they said, I renounce you, Satan, and your lies, because it's either lie or it's truth. Now, the second step I want to deal with today, and the part of this kind of a moral inventory would be this, is deception versus truth. And you'll see that all these kind of stack one upon the other as, as we have like building blocks here. But say, well, well, what is truth? Truth is the revelation of the Word of God. This is where we build our lives upon. Jesus said, you'll know the truth. He also said, wisdom is when you build your life on the rock. And the rock is the word of God. That you know these things and you do them. That's wisdom. And that's how you build a righteous life. But there's also not just that context of truth. But there's another context 
of truth and it's what's going on in your heart and your life. It's far too easy to be deceitful with ourselves, isn't it? It's far too easy. And what we always have to do is come back to the place of absolute honesty and say, I will be true with the Lord from right here. Jesus tells us in Scripture, you worship God in spirit and in truth. The truth right there is not that truth like we're talking about God's Word truth. It has to do with sincerity. It has to do with transparency. I'm not going to allow any lie in my heart, whether I've let Satan bring it there or whether I've put it there myself. I just want truth. And so we look at this today. Uh, I want to look in the context, first of all, of David when he's praying in Psalms 51. You remember David has come to a place of genuine brokenness. He's had this hidden sin in his life. He, he, you know, he had that relationship with Bathsheba. It, 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 there's, there's all kinds of immorality, murder. All this stuff is involved in David's life. And he's finally come into the place of brokenness. He said, before I confess these things to God, they were like a heavy burden. But he gets into Psalms 51 and he's just praying from his heart and being honest. He said, Behold, Lord, you desire the truth in the inward parts and the hidden parts you shall make known wisdom. How many of us this morning could be willing to say, God, I just want to be truthful right here. I don't want to live in deception. I don't want to deceive myself. I don't want Satan to deceive me. I want to be truthful. The Bible says, Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputes not iniquity and in whose spirit there is no guile. In other words, I want to be transparent with God. I don't, you know, I don't want to make excuses. A lot of times we'll hear a sermon on something, all of a sudden we begin to build this, you know, this, uh, this uh, legal case real quick on our behalf while we're not guilty when we are guilty. We're not going to be at that part. Now we're just saying, Lord, whatever there is in my life that's not right with you, I want to get it right with you. The Bible says that we speak the truth in love so that we may grow up into him into all things, which is the head, even Christ. That's Ephesians 4.15. Ephesians 4.25 says, put away lying. Every man speak the truth with his neighbor. We are members one of another. Ephesians 6, we shared with you a couple weeks ago, we talked about the armor. Having your loins girded about with what? Truth. So, it's just you and me. Let's just bow our heads again. And I would ask you, encourage you to pray this prayer along with me. Dear Father in heaven, I know you want the truth in my heart. And that facing truth is the only way to freedom. I want to acknowledge that I have been deceived in my life. I've let Satan deceive me. I've even deceived myself at times. But I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you would rebuke all deceiving spirits that are around my life by the power of Jesus' name and by the virtue of Jesus' blood by the authority of the resurrection of Jesus. Father, you're in my life. And because of that, I'm in you. I have your life. In an agreement with you, Heavenly Father, I command all deceiving spirits to depart from me. And I accept, Heavenly Father, your Holy Spirit, to guide me into your truth. I ask you, Lord, to search me, know my heart, and try me, know my thoughts, and see if there's any hurtful way in me, and lead me in the everlasting way. It's in Jesus' name I pray. You see, folks, deception is the most subtle of all satanic strongholds, I believe. And we're living in an age when people are so deceived, they just are not being honest. Lying is that self-defense mechanism that people use right off the bat. But the Bible tells us, Jesus says that all lies, you know, are from the father of lies. That lies are prompted by satanic forces and by evil spirits. Jesus said in John 8, 44, you're of your father, the devil. And the lust of your father, you'll do. He's a murderer from the beginning. He didn't abide in the truth because there is no truth in him. And when he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. Well, the greatest evidence was we began to embrace those lies and live out those lies. You know, I've never met a person with addictive behavior who didn't lie. Say, how do you know that? I were one. And people with addictive behavior are sometimes the very best liars you'll ever meet. 
They practice their lies. They rehearse their lies. They got their lies down to an art form. And that could be whether it's alcohol or drugs, anorexia, bulimia, sex offenders, I mean, whatever it might be, immorality on different levels. They got a reason. They got a lie for it. If it's not the truth, then it's a lie. What we do as Christians is we, we stand in faith, and our faith, our commitment to Christ and to his word is our response to the lie. I'm going to embrace the truth. I reject the lie. And you have to reject all of them, because at this point, Satan comes along with another lie and says, hey, I know you want to believe God, but you can't. And so we turn around and we say, I want to believe God, but I can't. <laughs> We just quote what he just wrote, amen? We just say what he just said. No, the Bible says God's given you a measure of faith. You can too. You can too. You can do what God wants you to do. You can believe God. You can trust God. You, so don't believe any kind of lie. Your faith ultimately is not something that I'm going to feel. It's not some emotion. It's not some power energy I release. My faith is my simple submission to the truth of God's word. I'm believe what God says and stand on that. If God said I'm free, I'm free. Are you with me? Say uh-huh. That felt good, didn't it? Step number three. <laughs> this is the toughest one for most of them. As we say, deception opens the door for most subtle of all satanic strongholds. There's another avenue which Satan uses in our life. And a lot of ground, especially by Christians given to the enemy in their life, is through this one issue. It's unforgiveness. You know, Paul wrote, To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgive anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave it. I am the person of Christ. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us. Notice, if I don't forgive, Satan gets an advantage of me. If we're not ignorant of his devices. Now listen carefully, because a lot of people, this is where the tune-out process Satan starts to work on right now. He wants to tune this out of your mind. Pay attention carefully. God requires you and God requires me to forgive. It's not optional. All right? It's a command. Forgive one another as you have been forgiven. Just as Christ has forgiven you, you forgive others. When we don't forgive, it's disobedience. And one place that we ought to be more like Jesus than about any other place is in this area because we've experienced his forgiveness. God forgave you. Isn't that awesome? God forgave you of everything you've ever... You said, I've done some bad stuff. I know. <laughs> we all have. But he, he did what? He forgave us. God forgave me. Everything, every issue, the big to the small to the middle, whatever it might be, however I might want to classify them, praise God that they're all been put under the blood of Jesus Christ and my sins are forgiven. Here's the issue is that we turn around and we won't forgive someone else. And it's so critical that we do this. And you say, why is it so critical? Because again, the cross of Christ. God gave me, God gave you what you did not deserve and what you did not earn and what you cannot merit. He just forgave you. The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ forgave us. It's important. Luke tells us, in chapter 6, verse 36, Be ye therefore merciful, as your heavenly Father is merciful. We show mercy. Ephesians 4 says, let the bitterness, let the wrath, let the anger, let the clamor, let the evil speaking. Boy, a lot of that comes out of bitterness, doesn't it? The anger, the wrath, the clamor, the evil speaking. Just, it's just a fountain out of which the bitterness is flowing. Let those things be put away from you with all malice. And there are lies Satan wants to tell. Well, you, you, you can't forgive that because it was too wretched. You can't forgive that because it, well, you, you, you can't forget it. Since you can't forget it, you can't forgive it. I, well, God said, well, you, uh, I, I'm not like God here. God says he'll cast it to see if his forgetfulness and he'll remember it no more. You're not really so stupid to think that God doesn't know about it still. Yeah. <laughs> when it says he'll remember it means no more, it means he'll never bring it up against you. Like we have a tendency to do with others. <laughs> He'll never use it as a weapon. He'll never use it and condemn you with it. It's, it's done with. It's a settled issue. The blood of Jesus Christ paid the price. For, aren't you glad for that? Amen? Yes. It's a paid issue. It's done. Now here's the thing that I, that I need to respond to as well. Is that I need to come to the same point and say, hey, I forgive it. I'm not going to forget it, but I'm not going to use it against you. I'm not going to let it hinder my relationship with you. I'm not going to let it hinder my fellowship with you. You know, I'm going to forgive it. I'm going to forgive it. Now, in time, if you live long enough, forgetting may be part of that process, or at least the memories will not hold the same effect. I found out the sooner as I forgive something, boy, the, Satan wants to come and bring back all those memories, doesn't he? Yes. And you say, well, I didn't forgive. Hey, excuse me, I did too. 
Just because I felt something doesn't mean I didn't do it. You may feel embittered in the moment, then then you simply come back to the point to say, listen, hey, I distinctly remember forgiving that person. On such and such time, I I was in my car when I forgave them. I I was sitting in, I went to the altar, I forgave them. And that's where the, the battles come in. But it is a choice and it is a crisis of will. Will you do God's will or will it be your will? Now, catch this, if you get anything from this one part of it, since God requires us to forgive, is that right? Yes. We're all on the same page. Then it, is, it means it, that we're able to forgive. It means it's a possibility. I just don't know. No. If God said we're to forgive, God doesn't tell us to do anything he doesn't empower us or strengthen us or equip us for. And it's costly. Ask Jesus about it. It hurt for him to forgive, did it not? It cost him everything to forgive. Romans 12, 19, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it's written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Now I share that scripture with, with you because one time when a person said to me, well, Why should I let him off the hook? How long you had him on that hook? How painful is it to have, pull it on that hook? Every time you go through the memories of it, every time you relive it, it's just the same old junk. It's like the guy who wouldn't forgive after the king had forgiven him much in scripture. It says he was cast out to the tormentors. And, and some of you are letting the tormentors, I mean, they're on the hook. And Satan's just beating you up about it all the time. Every time you come, you just, those bad juices begin to flow. Headaches start. Frustration comes. Blood starts to boil. Blood pressure goes up. You know, all that happens. You say, well, I just want to let them off the hook. Here's what you do. You take them off your hook and put them on God's. Amen. God says, I'll take care of it. I'll take care of them. Leave it to me. I know how to handle this. You don't. What I can do is, bring, is do something that will bring back glory and grace and righteousness and something that will be redemptive. You keep holding on to that pole with your little hook, you don't kill yourself. So it's important that we just do what God tells us to do. You say, well, how do you forgive from the heart? First, you acknowledge it. I was hurt, and it hurt a lot. And I didn't like it. I don't like, you know, I, it, 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 and, and you became angry about it. Well, acknowledge that. But you don't wait till you feel like it to forgive. You just begin the forgiveness process and the process is just doing it. Just do it. If you want to be free, you can be free. But this is a big one for a lot of people right here. But if you're ready to walk in freedom, bow your head with me and just repeat this prayer to me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your kindness to me and for your patience with me. For putting up with me. I confess to you that I have not extended that same mercy, that same patience and kindness towards others when they've offended me. Instead, I harbored resentment and have let bitterness come in. I pray that right now, during this time of self examination, you'll bring to my mind. Only the people that I have not forgiven that I can do so. But also pray that where I have offended others, you'd bring those people to mind as well. That I need to seek forgiveness from them. And show me how I can do that. I ask that in the name of Jesus. Now with your heads bowed just for a moment longer. When you pray something like that, I believe the Holy Spirit has a way of just bringing a name up, our names. And maybe it's something that's being blocked from your memory. But at this point in time, if God brought a name to your heart and mind, would you just tell the Lord that name? Lord, and just, just personally, Lord, I forgive Bob or Sue or Bill, whoever it might be. And then I forgive them for lying about me. I forgive them for abusing me. I forgive them. Whatever. Just be specific. And if God brings a name to your heart and mind, just, just tell the Lord. Lord, I forgive them. Don't say, Lord, help me forgive them. All right? He's already given you the help. You just need to free yourself from this issue. It's not important how you feel about it. It's important that you do it. Now, with your head still bowed, when I'm in a counseling situation, 95% of the people that I take through this step right here, the first two names that come to their mind are their parents. Crazy, huh? So you might just need to bow your head. It might be a mom or a dad. Say, Lord, I forgive my mom. 
for not being what I thought a mom should be. Or I forgive my dad. Anyone else the Lord brings to your mind? And I do this in Jesus' name. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Step number four. I try to deal with folks is in the area of rebellion versus submission. We're living in one of the most rebellious ages, at least in American history. <laughs> Nobody wants, to, you know, everybody lives the idea, nobody's going to tell me what to do. I don't have to submit to anything. I don't have to submit to anybody. You know, if I don't like my boss, I'll just quit. If I don't like my husband, I'll just leave. You know, it's where we are. If people just, you know, they don't have any kind of mutual submission, any kind of submission, ultimately no submission to God. But when you study scripture, you find that all authority flows from God. There's authority in the world. There's authority in government. There's authority in, in, in home. There's authority in the church. That God sets up these authorities. But we're such a rebellious age that we don't want to submit to, to authority. And rebellion on any level, write this down, leads to nothing but trouble in our lives. Always leads to trouble. And if we learn what it means to have a submissive attitude before the Lord, you know, it's amazing what God could do. Jesus is saying to us, you know, fall in line. What does that mean? Get in rank. It means that we fall in line and he's the head. And we're following his leadership. But he then tells us in scripture in multiple places about submission. Submission. In different areas of our life. And it really only have two responses when it comes to submitting. You know what they are? You don't want to know what they are? One is prayer. We can pray for those in authority. Scripture tells us to do that over and over. Right? Pray for those in authority. Pray for those. Pray for the king. Pray for your pastor. Pray for your husband. Pray for your boss. Pray for the president. Lord knows he needs it. Lord knows your husband needs it. <laughs> I mean, authority is a hard place to be in the world. When God places you there, you need the grace of God. So he says, pray for those. Who the other, is, the other is, is submission. We submit to God. The only time when we get to rebel against authority, this is, mark it down, the only time you get to rebel against authority is when they tell you to do something against the will of God. Isn't that right? That's the only choices we get. Now, I've tried to teach my children as they were coming up the art of appeal. You know? You can't beg, Daddy. Oh, please, oh, please, oh, please. That doesn't work. <laughs> but you can make an appeal. And your appeal must be based on some information that I may not have in when I made the decision. But, Dad, did you know? And it doesn't mean, Dad, did you know everybody else is doing it? That's not an appeal. <laughs> Practical information that I needed and wisdom to impart along with that appeal. And there were times that they obviously learned how. Now, sometimes my kids have gotten real good at using that in the wrong way. But anyway, we'll deal with them tomorrow. It's just you and me right now. First step, I think, is you ask God to forgive you for the times you've not been submissive in your own life. And sometimes it's not the matter of submission. You may be doing it, but your heart's not right. You know, it's like the little boy whose mother told him to go sit in the corner. He said, I'm going to sit in the corner, but I'm standing up in my heart. You know? Uh, that's rebellion as well. Amen? So, it's, it, Lord, forgive me the times I haven't, I haven't submitted. And I know that according to your sovereignty, you tell me that you work through established lines of authority. That's a principle in Scripture. So let's bow our head for a quick word of prayer. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, you tell me in Scripture, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And to be insubordinate is the same as iniquity and idolatry. I know that in my actions and my attitudes, I've sinned against you with a rebellious heart, and I ask your forgiveness for my rebellion. I pray you'd wash me clean. I also know in areas of my life where I've not had a submissive spirit, the authorities you've placed in my life. I ask you to wash me clean and forgive me. Lord, that I might know the full extent and the importance of this in my life. The importance of having a servant's heart. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord. Number five, deals with pride and humility. And each one of these, again, is built upon the other. Pride's a killer. 
And it goes like this, really. And, and, and Christians, you don't think it's a problem in your life, but basically we do it all the time. We tell God, I can do this on my own. We only turn to God when we're in desperate trouble. You know? And we say, well, I think we need to pray. And the guy says, do you think it's gotten that bad? <laughs> That's arrogance. We pray about everything. We rely on God for everything. And all too often, that's, that's not the fact, but that's what the Scripture teaches us. We absolutely need God. I, I was listening to a song. We were driving from one campus over to the other one about, that, I need you, Lord. You know? And we have the old hymns as well as modern contemporary songs. that all say this over, I need you, Lord. I need you, Lord. But at the same time, we don't live like that. And so often, we don't, we don't act like that. Philippians, Peter's right in the church, he's, he's rebuking them just for religiosity when he's talking about the circumcision. There were Judaizers that had come to the church telling the Christians, okay, it's, it, you're Gentiles, you're Christians, but you need a little, you need Jesus plus something, all right? And it's Jesus plus these works of the law, and then you'll be righteous. Uh, and Paul said, listen, all that led to in my life was arrogance. He said, I, he said, if anybody has any right to brag, I do. And he listed all his religious lineage and everything he'd done for God, but he didn't know God. He said, I count all that stuff as just rubbish now that I just might know Jesus Christ. And, and, and when he gets to this issue of pride in our lives, it's simply a matter of saying, God, I, am, I have been seeking to do this on my own. Now, this is a hard lesson that most people have to learn, usually within the first years of the Christianity, if they'll pay attention. But all too often we think that we're going to serve Jesus by the energy of our own flesh. You can't even do that. You need Jesus to serve Jesus. I mean, you just can't forgive on your own. You need Jesus to forgive. You can't just submit on your own. You need Jesus to submit. You just can't walk in light and truth on your own. If you choose to do it by your strength, you end up in deception. So, so much of this is the crux of everything we're saying right here. Is that I'm not going to live by my strength and my energy. I'm going to trust the Lord today for my life. I'm going to trust the Lord today for his strength. I'm going to trust the Lord today in temptation. I'm not just going to say no, 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 no. I'm going to embrace Jesus. We said last week, and his Bible says, draw near to God, then resist the devil. So you draw near to God first, then you deal with the enemy. So I want just to pray this, this, this prayer of commitment made to, to just live humbly before the Lord, if you would. Let's just bow our heads again. And again, whisper this out to your own ears to hear it. Just say, Lord in heaven, you make it clear that pride goes before destruction. An arrogant spirit goes before stumbling. I want to confess to you, I have not denied myself. I haven't picked up my cross daily and followed you daily. And when I do this, Lord, I give ground to the enemy. Forgive me for when I thought I could be victorious without you. Or I thought I could be successful without you that I could accomplish in my life by my own strength, your will. I want to tell you right now, Father, that was a sin against you, putting my will before yours. I ask you now in the name of Jesus to cancel all ground given to the enemy in my life through my rebellion and my pride. I need your guidance that I won't live a life from selfishness or empty conceit, but with a humble mind, I'll regard others as more important than myself. I'll regard you as more important than myself. I ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Step number six. Both of these are very brief. But James says it this way. God gives a greater grace. He's opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. Draw near to God. He'll draw nigh to you. You cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep and let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you. This is an element of just bondage versus freedom in our life. This kind of wraps everything up these next two steps do. Of everything that we've ever said yes to the enemy in our life and given him ground to gain, we're clearing the ground off. We're saying, you don't have any permission to build in this neighborhood anymore. 
No more strongholds are going to be established here. No more refuges for your lies to be placed in my mind and in my heart and life. I just want to trust you. And, and when we come to Christ and we, we do what we're doing this morning, we get these private times when, when you're just yourself and the Lord and you're confessing things, you know, that's glorious. And you need to walk away from, the, from that moment and say, you know, I believe what 1 John 1, 9 says. That if I confess my sins, God is faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me. I don't have to carry around this heavy blanket. I don't have to wear this little dark cloud over my head. I have not only been forgiven, I'm washed. I'm clean. Pure as the driven snow. I am clean before God. And you need to trust the Lord for that and believe that in your heart and your life because it is, it's not just a nice verse in the Bible. It's a fact. You're made clean by the Spirit of God, by the blood of Jesus Christ. And sometimes for some people that's good enough. Sometimes there needs to be maybe a point of accountability. Maybe you've been struggling with somebody in your life. Then you need to find a faithful brother, a mature brother in Christ, somebody who walks with God and maybe even walked through that before in their own life and lives in victory in their life and find them as, a, as a, a, someone you can pray with and confide in. And let me tell you, first of all, we talk about a lot about accountability partners. You know who my, my main accountability partner is in my life? It's my wife. You know, we're one. We need to have kind of transparency with each other, all right? But, but there are times when we are struggling there, it never hurts. You know, two are stronger than one, the Bible says. A strand of three cords is not easily broken. I, I'm not this kind of preacher who gets up and says, well, you confess your sins to one another, and we want to get up and hear everybody's stuff. I ain't listening. I got enough dirty laundry at my house. <laughs> I don't want to hear about yours. You know, if you need accountability for it, that's something else. We'll pray about it. We'll see what God does. But uh, I'm not so much on this. These, and I don't think that's what the Scripture says. Confess your sins to one another that you may be healed. I think he's talking about an, as, as a brother or sister, somebody that's accountable, somebody that knows how to hold even something of confidentiality. Amen. But I think it's important that we acknowledge our freedom in Christ. So if you would, just bow your heads briefly with me again and pray this prayer with me. Say, Dear Father in heaven, you told me to put on Jesus Christ and not to make provision for my flesh in regard to its desires. I want to acknowledge where I've walked in bondage, where I've given in to the lust of my flesh on some level in my life. I thank you that in you, Jesus, all my sins are forgiven. And where I have disobeyed you, where I've transgressed your word, I know I've given the devil an opportunity. But I come before you, Father, in your presence and acknowledge these sins in my life and claim your cleansing in my heart and thank you now that I can be freed from the bondage of sin. And I ask you in these next day or days to reveal to my heart and mind where I have been transgressing and breaking your word, where I have grieved your Holy Spirit, because I want to walk in freedom in all the areas of my life. Now, with your heads bowed just for a moment, maybe the Lord just then, when you said that, exposed something going on, or maybe through this process of these steps, you saw some things in your life that weren't right with God, and God brought them. Why don't you just acknowledge those before God right now? Lord God, I confess this sin of lying. I confess this sin of this addictive behavior in my life. I confess the sin of whatever it is. Just say, Lord, I, I ask you to forgive me and cleanse me of these things in my heart and life. And then just right there we are. Say, I claim the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus in my life. I cancel all ground Satan's ever had in my life through my willful involvement. And just tell him thank you in the precious name of Jesus, my Lord and Savior. Don't be surprised the Lord brings some other things to your heart and mind the next days if you're really serious about this. If we want to be free in our inner person. The last is this one, and may apply to you, may not apply. Step seven, which I truly close out a counseling session with, this is acquiescence versus renunciation. You know, there's that passage in Exodus chapter 20, it's on the screen, where the Lord says, you know, to those people who worship false gods and things, that he'll visit the iniquity of that sin. He'll visit, it basically occurs from the third, fourth generation down. Now, specifically what he's talking about there are the sins, we call them ancestral sins, but it's ancestral sins related to worshiping false gods. I think the cult falls into that, that, that area. You know, cultic things fall into that area. We've, we worship a false god, a false deity or whatever. There's a lot of new age things, I think, that fall into that. 
Now, a lot of times people make reference to this. Well, you know, I noticed in my life there's been this particular addiction or this particular sin or whatever it might be. You know, does that fall into this category? That's going to be between you and the Lord. What I decided to do a long ago is just claim this prayer. I'm getting ready to pray with you and just cover my bases. Amen. Because I want absolute freedom in every area of my life. But I do believe there's some sins that seem to go from generation to generation because somebody somewhere on the line is not drawing the line. And sometimes that takes two or three generations of people drawing the line to break that out of your family, you know. And uh, so what I told my kids, and they've since had to learn the hard way, at least one of them, is, you know, that, hey, it stops here. This line stops here. It's not going any further. I'm not going to pass this down to children, grandchildren, great-grandkids. This, this was in my life, but I've gotten right, and I've gotten free with God. And I'm walking in my freedom. Amen. So this, is this, this, is, this verse is powerful, but I want you to realize that the, ne the next verse up there is, is even more powerful. When we submit to God and to his word, to his commandments, to his will, he shows loving kindness to thousands. And so that's what I want God to do in my family and with my children and with my grandchildren, to show his loving kindness. But it starts here. Amen? It starts with us. So this simple prayer of rejection of anything that Satan might have entangled my life with due to some ancestral thing or whatever it might be, and to believe God for his grace and his deliverance around my family. So if you want, would you pray this prayer with me? Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you just as your child, purchased by your blood, belonging to your son Jesus. Right here and right now, I reject and disown the sins of my ancestors. I've been delivered from the power of darkness. I've been translated into your kingdom, the kingdom of your son. So by your authority, I cancel out all of Satan's working that might have passed on to me from my ancestors. I'm crucified with Jesus. I'm alive in Jesus. I'm raised up with Jesus. And I thank you the authority that belongs to you, Jesus, can be imposed over Satan in my life. So I now command by that authority every familiar spirit, every enemy of the Lord that's been around me, on me, or in me to flee my presence, never to return. And I ask you, Heavenly Father, to fill me with your Holy Spirit. I submit my body as an instrument of righteousness, as a living sacrifice, that I might glorify you in my body. And I do this because of your grace. And I do it in the name and the authority of the name of my Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That'll be $300. <laughs> That's a lot of material this morning, all right? And I know it. And we're not going to give an invitation, so I'll just wrap it up with that. But I will say, there will be some things. This is, this is not, this, that's a lot of head knowledge. But I do believe there'll be specific things that God will speak to your heart about, right? That you take those with you this week, and you look at the Scripture. If you have questions about something, I don't know if I believe that. Get your Bible out first, all right? Then you can come to me, but get your Bible out first. And see if you can see what God says in his word about it. And then, then, then come share that with me, all right? Because God wants us free. But we need to invest ourselves and make the commitments. So I believe with all my heart, you know, that Satan comes at all times trying to come bring us back to that bondage. So you remember that when you do leave here, just what you did here, you can do anywhere. I just rebuke Satan. You don't have authority in my life in this anymore. Don't you remember what he did to you? Hey, I forgave him in Jesus' name. You know, that Sunday morning. Me and my one-on-one -on -one counseling session, my pastor, I forgave him. <laughs> so as you go through life, don't be surprised. I remember doing this in my life, going through these seven steps, these same specific seven steps, and walking out of that counseling room thinking, I'm free, thank you, Jesus, for that, and not getting my car. But five minutes later, a bunch of stuff started coming up in my heart and mind. And I just remembered just do the same thing again. Say, I've dealt with that. I'm free. I've done to the blood of Jesus. Praise God. Well, why don't you come back? I don't have to. The greatest freedom you're going to discover is when you look the devil in the eye one day and say, I don't have to. And I'm not. Don't have to, I'm not. I got better things to do. Leave me alone in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Brother Tim has a couple announcements. Right before he comes, I want to remind you again about the leadership dinner to put that on your, your list of stuff. If you are a first-time guest today, I'll be out here at our Welcome Center. Take a moment, stop by. I have a gift I'd like to place in your hand. Thank you for being a part of our...